as good a ball as Willis has bowled. It was up, it was on a length, it was on line, it moved in a little, and Richard simply walked into it and on drove it. His first cricket commentary was in 1946. He didn't miss a test in England after that. In the 50s, Arlott flirted with politics as an unsuccessful Liberal candidate in Epping. But by now, his love of cricket was dominant. As a commentator, he was peerless. Arlott wrote, too, more than 40 books and regular reports for the Guardian newspaper. He wrote as well on wine, another of his great loves. It was perhaps his ultimate pleasure, sipping a fine red, talking cricket. In 1980, Arlott made his final test commentary, the centenary match against Australia at Lords. He left the cricketing stage unobtrusively. No fuss, no goodbyes. After Trevor Batty, it will be Christopher Martin Jenkins. But the spontaneous applause of his fellow commentators said it all. The club's most famous chairman was John Arlott, CBE, who loved Alderney and lived here for the last 11 years of his life. He was a great character and raconteur and very much part of the Alderney scene. It's only on the field itself there might be problems, according to the wise old man of Alderney cricket, John Arlott, who has his own views on the captain, Ray Parkin. Oh. He's perfect. He can't bat, he can't bowl, he can't captain, but he's a hell of a nice chap. Who chooses the team? He does. Well, they choose it themselves just by turning up, you know. How many can they choose from? Not many, about 11 as a rule. Warning notices to be erected around the ground in French. France, after all, is only eight miles away. But none of this wins matches, according to wise old man John Arlott. Of course, that's not his official position. I'm the chairman. But what does that involve? Chairing the annual general meeting and turning up for matches and taking bottles of fizz to refresh both teams after the match. Do you ever discuss policy at all? Yes. And I say something and the captain contradicts it and that's the end of the thing. If you were advisor to the Aboriginal side, what would you tell them to do to ensure winning? Well, just to take it easy. Not knock anybody out. John, who do you think will win? I don't think there's any doubt about it, the Aboriginals, easily. Why? Alderney have a very good reputation on their own ground, and they don't play on the other ground. No, but there are only two players good enough to stand up to the Aboriginals at all. One good batsman who really can score fast and well, and one all-rounder, but for the rest, they wouldn't measure up. I must say, in these sweaters, those baggy caps, I'd have taken you for ordinary Australia if you had no pizza. You damn polite. <laughs> I was really fond of John Arlott. I'd known him for years and years. Um, he was always the greatest name in cricket. I mean, we all admired him. He was just a one-off. There was never another one at all like him. 
but when he came to live here after he retired, another side of John emerged very unexpectedly. He became an actor. Now you may find this hard to believe, but he was a very good actor and we used to write special parts for him in the Rosebud films, three silent films, black and white, made by Ronnie Cairnduff and with John as a really leading thespian in it. Rosebud and the Girl from Caskets, that was great fun, it really was. He was the wicked grandfather and there was one marvellous scene when Rosebud was chased by the wicked, wicked lighthouse keeper round and round the top of the lighthouse and the wicked lighthouse keeper really loved every moment of it was Doddy. And then there was Rosebud and the Godfathers. Now in that, John started off as a pirate rowing ashore and it was all set in the 18th century to start with and then we suddenly become modern at the very end and he, believe it or not, is a wicked or really pilot. He suddenly turns around, that was great fun filming in the aircraft. And finally, I think my favourite of all, Rosebud and the Murder on the Orkney Express. And it was a takeoff of the famous film about the Orient Express. And we filmed the entire thing practically on the train here, on the little train. And everybody was in it, they really were. And John really, really enjoyed that. Well, we all did. I really miss John, I was, you know, very fond of him and he used to ring me up every morning about nine o'clock and this voice would say, when are you going to come and see me? And I used to go in oh, about twice a week always and I miss him dreadfully but the thing is that ever since then, he used to, one of the things he really loved was John Arlott's chutney and ever since then, about four or five times a year now, I make chutney and on the labels I always put John Arlott's spring chutney, John Arlott's summer chutney. John Holt's winter chutney, or whatever, and everybody loves it, just like we loved him. Well, he was marvellous to work with because he was the real professional, but he, he had the edge over us, he was a poet. So he could do these marvellous pictures painted with words, which we couldn't do, you know, and we had never been able to do. And he had this marvellous turn of phrase and the wit, the knowledge, he had this deep love of cricket, and he loved cricketers, and the, the great tribute, which I know he liked better than when they made him president of the association. You see, he still was president up to last night. A crisp, clear winter's morning greeted the mourners as they made their way slowly to St Anne's Church. The stark beauty of the leafless trees, bathed in sunshine, belied the sadness of the occasion. Young and old, friend and relative, they'd come to say goodbye to an adopted son, a man who'd made Alderney his home and become an integral part of its fabric. John Arlott inspired loyalty and devotion in his friends and returned it in equal measure, leaving mourners fighting valiantly between the sadness of his death and the wealth of happy memories he left behind. His wife Pat, best friend Jack Donovan, and his son Robert were the last to arrive. Inside the church, Jack gave a moving tribute to his friend of nearly 70 years. He paid special tribute to John's family and Jeff Renard and June Godion, who helped look after John in the final months. His voice choked with emotion as he said his final farewell. John Arlott was a multi-talented man and the congregation sang a hymn written by him. spent most of his life in Hampshire, but it was here, in his adopted home, that he chose to be buried. He had a deep, abiding influence on many people's lives. John Arlott lived a full and largely happy life, and everyone has their favourite memory. 
my favourite story of John regarding cricket is the fact he told me the story of that in cricket, when you're out, you're out, even if you're not out. In 1979, he telephoned, and I heard this voice saying, I'd like a double room with a private bathroom and uh, a pair, couple of, twi of singles or a twin, if that. And I thought, I know this voice, you know. And then he said, oh, that's the name. And I thought, of course it is. Because, of course, I suppose he was the most instantly recognisable voice in Britain for, for so long. Um, and uh, he came and stayed at my hotel, and we've been great friends ever since. And uh, I shall miss him tremendously. Yeah. Every time I came to Alden, it was to see John Arlott. And, and today, I didn't come to see him, or I came to say goodbye to him. But he was a very warm, passionate, emotional man, sometimes sentimental, strong feelings. Uh, I've known John since I was 15. Um, he's just a very important part of my life uh, as a friend, uh, someone I used to be able to go and sit and when the times were good or bad, you know, sit down and have a glass of wine and we used to put the world to rights a few times. How do you think he'd like to be remembered? As a man that probably enjoyed life. He wasn't here for a long time, but he was here for a bloody good time. John Arlott gave up commentating in 1980. His gruff, articulate descriptions of the game which typifies the English have been sadly missed. But he didn't change. His family and friends were able to enjoy his retirement in Alderney. But now the unique Hampshire Burr is gone forever, leaving only a wealth of memories and a host of fond farewells. He was just obsessed with cricket, um, and I think he was his own unique person with this marvellous Hampshire bird. It, it was cricket. 69 foot 10. 69 foot 10. 69 foot 10. By the cruelest irony, it was the voice, that famous voice, which far from simply weakening with age, could sometimes barely be summoned at all. So merciless were the emphysema and bronchitis. Forced to listen, with little strength for response, he would smile his crinkly smile and weep by way of reassurance. Thanks to recording technology, John Arlott's voice will be heard at the touch of a switch, and his kindly face can be called up on the screen forevermore. For this we must be thankful. <laughs>